Well, hello, it's Deepak Bhatt reporting from ACC.org. I'm here in Rome at the European Society of Cardiology. We're towards the tail end of the meeting now. It's been a fantastic meeting. Lots of great data, lots of great trials and registries, and we're going to review some of them. And I'm really lucky to have with me my good friend and colleague, Professor Keith Fox. He is a superstar here at the European Society of Cardiology and worldwide, and we're lucky to have his insights. So welcome. Deepak, great to, great to be with you. So uh, let's start off maybe with PROG-16. It's a trial that pertains to stroke, but I think it might be relevant to cardiovascular specialists. Yeah, I think PROG-16 says, where's the future going to be? Not proven yet, but it shows the feasibility of thrombectomy in stroke. And, you know, this is a big uncertainty. And, you know, there's always a concern about lytic therapies and the Absolutely. fact that lytic therapy usage is pretty low. Right. So here's a study that shows it's at least feasible to do it, doesn't apparently produce harm, right. and maybe this is the precursor of the big study that needs to be done. I'm totally with you. You know, thrombectomy, manual thrombectomy in STEMI hasn't totally panned out in the big trials, but maybe for stroke it will. Certainly some of the trials to date with stent retrievers and other clot retrieving technology in stroke seems to be really good. Yeah. This might be the next big thing. Great. Uh, how about the trial on the reversal agent for factor 10A inhibitors? What do you think of that uh, trial and then just that concept? What should doctors do? Because this agent will likely start to be available in different parts of the world in the next year or two. Yes, we're talking about adexinate alpha right. and its role as a reversal of, of the 10A inhibitors. And obviously, there's already the availability of the dibigatan reversal agent. Correct. Um, nobody fully knows the role of these agents, but there will be a role in people that have the need for an emergency procedure. Sure. You know, if we're in a, a road traffic accident, Absolutely. Uh, a, a splenic rupture. But my serious worry is that they may be overused in individuals that have a modest bleed that could be treated conservatively. And then the possibility of an overshoot and thrombosis. Yeah, so I'm with you. I, not that I'm so worried about rebound per se, but just the lack of anti-thrombotic protection. Mm. So I think if someone comes with major trauma, this is a huge advance. Yeah. But you know, if they just need an elective procedure, I'm afraid people will just say, oh, the patient's gonna get a cath, and especially if it's a radial cath, yeah. is it really necessary to reverse? Probably yeah. not. So I, I agree with you, an important advance, but we need to make sure yeah. we use it in the right patients. So Deepak, one of the really interesting studies presented, and I know you're involved in it, was Clarify. Oh, right. Tell us about that. Sure, so this is a registry. It's actually a registry of patients with stable angina, coronary artery disease, stable coronary artery disease. But the analysis, and Gabriel Steg, our, our good friend, just uh, presented these data, was to see whether there is or is not a J curve for blood pressure in patients with coronary artery disease. That is, is lower better or, or can you go too low? And in fact, we found a J-curve. You can go too low. That is, at low blood pressures, say below 120 over 70 or so, uh, there actually wasn't any further decrease yeah. in events. In fact, an increase in events, the so-called J-curve. So as some had speculated, maybe patients with coronary artery disease, especially where coronary flow is so diastolic dependent, dropping the blood pressure too low can backfire. We didn't see that for stroke, but we saw that J-curve for other ischemic events. So that really important, that is implications for management. That's right, so yeah, be aggressive with blood pressure, but don't go totally crazy. Okay, so, so let's now talk about the, uh, the Ticagrelor study oh, right. in relation to stroke. Right, so this is a, a sub-study uh, of the Pegasus trial, which was a trial of Ticagrelor versus Clopidogrel in stable post-MI patients. 12 months uh, post-MI, and the overall trial was positive for Ticagrelor versus Clopidogrel. This analysis looked at stroke as an endpoint and found a significant reduction in stroke, really an ischemic stroke, uh, with uh, the use of Ticagrelor versus placebo uh, as a placebo-controlled trial. Um, and uh, that, I think, is an important finding. It validates, in fact, what we saw in Charisma many years yeah, ago yeah. with clopidogrel versus placebo. But one of the things that's going to confuse many people is uh, this in the context of Socrates, which was a different comparison. Right. I mean, it gets confusing. I might have even misspoken there because, you know, Plato was clopidogrel versus ticagrelor, superiority of ticagrelor. Uh, in ACS, Pegasus was ticagrelor. On top of aspirin. Yes, Pegasus was ticagrelor 
versus placebo, everybody gets aspirin, ticagrelor beat placebo. Socrates, which was a stroke trial, was ticagrelor monotherapy versus aspirin monotherapy, and there, ticagrelor didn't win. Uh, it did there, not it win. was not superior in a statistical sense. There were some trends, and if you do the analyses different ways, maybe the trial was underpowered, maybe ticagrelor is better, but from a bottom line perspective, uh, aspirin performed as well as ticagrelor. But that was different. That was a stroke population. Pegasus, we're talking about a CAD population, in fact, a post-MI stabilized population where dual antiplatelet therapy reduced ischemic events. And that's exactly what we saw in Charisma, um, in fact, in the overall trial. So I think there's something there, and in fact, even further corroborating that uh, line of thinking in Timmy 50 with Vorapaxar yeah. versus placebo yeah. in the uh, MI population, there was a reduction in ischemic so, stroke. So reinforcing that cardiologists need to think outside the box, the whole vascular Absolutely. tree. Absolutely. When we're thinking about antiplatelet therapy, it's not just stent thrombosis, it's not just non-fatal MI, it's also potentially reducing ischemic stroke. Terrific. But it's important, though, to realize that if patients are at really high bleeding risk, prior intracranial hemorrhage, obviously use common sense. You Absolutely. Know, there you don't want to just use potent uh, dual yep. antiplatelet therapy without some thought. Well, I think those are Terrific. really interesting registries and trials. Thank you so much thank for you your so insights. Thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for joining us. We're having a wonderful time here in Rome. So I hope you're you having a good here? time at home. <laughs>